welcome you all to this 18th session of ECG basic and beyond uh, this uh, today we it will be a uh, wonderful session i think because we'll talk on ECG in children normal and abnormal as usual we have got uh, our professor abdul wadud Choudhury sir and Professor M. Athar Ali sir with us. Professor Dr. Rufiq Ahmed sir will also join with us. And our today's speaker is Dr. Abdullah Al Jamil. Uh, we are lucky that we have got a number of pediatric cardiologists with us. Professor Jahid Hussain sir, Professor and Chairman of the Pediatric Cardiology Department of BSMMU. Brigadier General <coughs> Noon Nahar Fatima, madam, uh, is with us. Dr. Rejwana Rima is with us from Shish Dhaka Shishu Hashpatal. Dr. Jakia, Associate Professor of Pediatric Cardiology from NICVD. And Dr. Naharuma Choudhury from Heart Foundation is with us. Uh, may I request Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury sir to say a few words about today's topic. Assalamu alaikum. Hello. Am I audible? Audible. Sir, I'm to noise. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. But there is some noise in, from your side. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, you are audible. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible, sir. You can go on. Sir, Bolin, a practitioner that check. Samalikum. Today, we are going to have a lecture about pediatric ECG. Well, we are an adult cardiologist. We don't have to deal with it that much. But in pay phase, where there are not many uh, cardiologists as well as pediatrician available, the general physician and the general cardiologist has to deal sometimes with the ECGs of a child, of a kid, of a youngster. And then we face some difficulty because our knowledge is very much limited about that. Today, surprisingly, we have arranged the talk on pediatric ECG by an adult cardiologist. Why is that? Because we want to have the perspective of ours, the adult cardiologist view on pediatric cardiology, how we want to how we interpret it. Now, the eminent uh, panelists who are here from our very own uh, Professor Brigadier Janet Munar Fatima, Professor Jahid Hussain, and also the youngsters, uh, Rejana Rima, Nahruma, Ayyahaita Chiyotri, and they will be commenting how we deal with that. And they'll be guiding us in future how and what we did it as well. Jackie is here as well. So uh, welcome to everybody. And let us enjoy together. Dr. Abdullah Jamil is not a cardiologist only. He's a poet. He's a singer. So I don't know whether he'll be singing us or reciting a poet of his own when he will be giving a lecture on pediatric ECG. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Abdullah Jamil, uh, as Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury, sir, mentioned that he is a eminent cardiologist of Bangladesh. He is a very good interventional cardiologist. He is also expert in electrophysiology and he is also expert in poetry and also with music. We are happy to say that we have got uh, other pediatric cardiologists also. Dr. Ataul is with us. Now, may I request Dr. Abdullah Jamil sir to go for his presentation. Abdullah Jamil, please. Ataul, welcome. Thank you, Firoz. <coughs> uh, thank you very much for introducing me in a different way. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Good evening. Uh, today I'm, uh, I was supposed to talk about uh, the normal and abnormal both issues in uh, children, but 
uh, to me, uh, the both the item is so vast. So I decided uh, to today I, I would present only the normal issues in children, uh, as because there are a lot of things I learned by preparing this lecture, which were unknown to me, and uh, I beg another session for the abnormal issues in children to the uh, authority. So I start uh, sharing my uh, presentation. Is it visible? Uh, not yet, sir. Now it's visible. You okay. can go for slideshow. Uh, it's fine, sir. Okay. Uh, so, as uh, uh, Dr. Adhar Ali, Dr. Wadud, and both of them asked for reciting a poem, so I am uh, reciting a small poem from my last published book, Alik uh, Bhavishwate Nirjan Otit. The uh, headline of the poem is Nirvak Prithivi. হঠাৎ হঠাৎ পৃথিবী থেকে আকাশটা পালাতে চায় আকাশের মেঘগুলো অভিমানে ঝরে পড়ে বৃষ্টি হয়ে পৃথিবী কিছু না বলে মেদু হাসে ঝড় এসে বাতাসে বাতাসের গালে চড় মারে বাতাস মনের দুঃখে দুনিয়া ছেড়ে যেতে চায় নির্বাক পৃথিবী মৃদু শুধু মৃদু হেসে যায় ফুলের রেনু মেখে ভ্রমর মধু খায় অট্ট হাসিতে পৃথিবী স্বাগত জানায় ভালোবাসা ধন্যবাদ সো নাও আই কাম টু দ্য মেইন প্রেজেন্টেশন ইসিজি ইন চিলড্রেন নর্মাল সো ইন ফার্স্ট অফ অল বাট ওয়াদুদ সেড উই লার্ন নো ভেরি লেস অ্যাবাউট দি ইসিজিজ অফ চিলড্রেন even uh, uh, for the general clinicians adult cardiologists even junior pediatrician uh, experience uh, has little experience of interpreting pediatric ecg the basic principles of cardiac conduction is almost same as uh, the, the uh, that of uh, adult ecg this uh, conduction and depolarization there are age related changes in the anatomy and physiology of infants and children and that produce normally change for electrocardiographic features that differs from adult ecg so what are the indication of doing ecg in a children in a child chest pain in children is rarely cardiac of origin the typical indications includes syncope exertional symptoms tachyarrhythmias bradyarrhythmias and drug ingestion especially uh, that uh, drug intoxication uh, by ingesting uh, especially the uh, different toxic drugs by accidentally by, the, by a child and to evaluate the congenital heart defects age related chin, uh, changes that includes features that would be diagnosed as abnormal in an adult uh, electrocardiogram may be normal as an age related change in the pediatric ecg at birth the right ventricle is larger and thicker than the left ventricle the left ventricle increases in size until it's it is larger than the right ventricle by the age of one month by age six months the ratio of the right ventricle to the left ventricle is similar to that of an adult the t wave in the in lead v1 inverts by seven days and typically remains inverted until last age of seven years Upright T-waves in the right precordial leads, V1 to V3, between age 7 days and 7 years, 
are a potentially important abnormality and usually indicate right ventricular hypertrophy. So uh, the placement of leads, limb leads placed on the top part of the arm or leg, uh, that causes uh, less muscle interference when the kid moves. And the precordial leads, uh, V, as like adults, V1, V2 placed in the fourth in intercostal space in the right and left. Uh, V3, midway between V2 and V4 as in adult, uh, in the fifth intercostal space, left mid cubicular line. V4R is, uh, is the fifth intercostal space, right wing mid clavicular line. Use this lead for V4R must be leveled on such an ECG. So it is taken uh, instead of V4 uh, as because uh, the light, uh, to record the right ventricular predominance in the infant and children. V5, V6, same as anterior axillary and mesillary line on the left side. Uh, from the horizontal plane from V4. So these are the uh, diagrammatic representation at the fourth intercostal space, V1, fourth intercostal space, left side, V2, V3. So instead of V4 in the left side, uh, lead electrode is placed in the V4R. Then on the right side, on the midclavicular line, in the fifth intercostal space, and from this point, the, on the horizontal line, anterior axillary and mid axillary line, the V5, uh, V4, I1, V6 leads are placed. So uh, these are the common findings in a uh, pediatric ECG, heart rate usually over 100 beats per minute. Rightward QRS axis is usually uh, more than plus 90 degree. Marked sinus arrhythmia. Short tear interval, usually less than 120 milliseconds, and QRS duration less than 80 milliseconds. Slightly peaked P waves, this less than 33 millimeter in height is normal if it is uh, uh, in a equal to less than six month children. T wave inversion in V1 to V3. This is called juvenile QF pattern. And this often persists in adult age also when it is called persistent juvenile pattern. Dominant R wave in V1, RS R dash pattern in V1, slightly long QTC interval is equal to less than 90 millisecond in infants. Uh, at uh, six uh, months or less. Q wave in the inferior and left precordial leads are common. Now stepwise assessment of pediatric ECG. <coughs> First come with the rate of the heart. Heart uh, rate is determined same way in, as in adult ECG. Resting heart rate varies with age. Newborn between 110 and 150 beats per minute. At two years, 85 to 125 beats per minute. At four years, 75 to 150 beats per minute. At six years, 60 to 100 beats per minute is that of adult heart rate. Uh, important thing is uh, why the rate is more in infant and children as because the younger the children, the higher the metabolic rate and lower the vagal tone, so heart rate remains high. The rhythm, common variations in rhythm, which may be normal in pediatric age group, is pronounced sinus arrhythmia, short sinus pauses, less, uh, is uh, equal to less than 1.8 second. First degree atrioventricular block, Mobis type one, second degree atrioventricular block. It is one Quebec phenomenon. There may be junctional rhythm event. Ventricular or supraventricular extrasystole may be present. Pewets. 
P wave has no significant difference from that of adults. Normal P wave amplitude is less than three millimeter. Normal P wave duration is less than 0 0.09 second in the children and 0 0.07 second in infants. The QRS complex, first we come to the QRS axis, calculated using the hexaxial reference system as shown below, like that of um, adult uh, ECG. And I'm not going to details about this hexaxial reference system. It has been discussed earlier during the discussion of adult ECG. So roughly QRXs, we can guess uh, considering lead one, standard lead one and lead ABF. This is called the rule of thumb. If we position our thumbs over this peak of the R waves in these two leads, if uh, the lead one is positive, is higher uh, in lead one, and V also higher, almost equal. So the axis is normal, zero to 90 degree. If positive in lead one, negative in ABF, then is between zero to minus 90 degree. So possible left axis deviation. If negative in lead V1, uh, standard one, and uh, positive in AVF, the right axis deviation is plus 90 to 180 degree. If both negative, the extreme left axis this is in the upper left quadrant, minus 90 to um, plus 180 degree. The right ventricular hypertrophy of neonates regress over the first few months of life. And this change is reflected in the axis of QRS complex. The mean frontal pain QRS of the neonate is around 70 degree with a range from 60 to 160 degree. It's plus 60 to plus 160 degree. There is a rapid change in axis over the first year of life. From, the, from this age onwards, the mean frontal QRS axis is around plus 65 to plus 70 degree with a range from zero to plus 110 one, degrees. So age related variation of the QRS axis, first week to first month, average is plus 110 degree, range plus 30 to plus 180 degree. So it indicates the right do, uh, ventricular dominance. From one month to three months, plus 70 degree average, range plus 10 to plus 125 degree. At three months to three years, plus 60 degree average, range uh, plus 10 to 110 degree. It's almost near to the normal adult ECG. Over three years, 60 degree average and ranges between plus 20 to one, plus 120. In adults, average is 50 range minus 30 to 105 degree Celsius, uh, five degrees. The Q web, Q web appears in lead two, three ABF, V5 and V6 in, in a uh, pediatric ECG. The amplitude is double over the first few months of the life, reaching maximum of about three to five years of age and then decline to the initial value of the newborn period. QF of up to 0.6 to 0.8 millivolt would fall within normal range of the chil children in the six months to three years of age. R and S waves, <coughs> the amplitude of R wave in right chest lead of the normal children decrease with age while the amplitude increase in the left chest leads. Similar but inverse change occurs in respect, in respect of the S wave amplitude. The RS ratio in V1 remains more than one up to about three years of age, but will remain more than one in some normal individuals even into the eight to 12 years of age group. 
So this table shows uh, the age-related uh, changes in V1, V2, uh, V6 of the two studies. One is Riesenbeck median, uh, another one is Devignon median. So they showed uh, the, these changes. Uh, this study was on male children and this was on uh, female children. I'm not going to details of this uh, table. Now the QRS duration. It varies with age. The QRS duration in infants and children is shorter than that of adults. So uh, this table shows uh, from zero to one month, uh, duration average um, 50, upper range is 70. Uh, one, one to six months is almost same, six to 12 months same. Uh, one to three years, it increases a little bit by 10 milliseconds. Ever, uh, range, upper range is same. Uh, uh, by three to eight years, more than uh, 10 milliseconds increase the duration. The upper range is 80 milliseconds. By the age of eight to 12, uh, 70 remain, uh, average remains same, but the range, upper range increases to 90. Uh, by 12 to 16, it almost adult, near to adult, this uh, uh, average is 70 and upper range is 80. In adult, uh, 100. Uh, in adult, 80 millisecond is the average and upper limit is 100 millisecond. Sorry, I got stuck up. Now comes the Javin said, Pun Shamsha, Che. Our computer take to Javala. Can I see now? Yes, we can see you. Okay. You will slide also. Yes. Now come to the T web. Throughout childhood, the T web pattern, particularly in picorial leads, is very different to that of adults. There is a progressive change in T web axis from birth to early adult life. In the first two to three days of life, upright T webs in the right precordial leads, that is V1 to V3R, are normal. It is usual for the T webs in these leads to invert in the majority of infants during the first week of life. Persistence of a positive T web in V1 or V3R beyond the first week of life should raise the suspicion of abnormality. The T wave remains inverted in these leads in the majority of children into the 12 to 16 years age group, the juvenile pattern. The T wave in V1 and V6, uh, V5 and V6 should be upright at all ages except a small number of children. The normal, uh, now we come to the ECG intervals, that is PR interval first. The normal peer interval varies with age and heart rate. So younger the children, the peer interval will be shorter. And uh, more the heart rate, the peer interval will also be shorter. So it shows the similar range from uh, zero to one month. Um, heart rate, uh, this line shows heart rate. And it uh, gradually, you can see from this uh, chart, as a big chart and with the uh, uh, range, uh, it may be as low as 100 millisecond with a heart rate of 80 to 99. And um, in adult, it is the average is 150. And uh, 
upper limit is uh, 200 millisecond. So I'm not going to details of this. Um, uh, now the QT interval is same calculated uh, corrected um, QT interval is done by the base formula is QT measured divided by square root of RR interval similar to adult. The mean normal QTC is around 410 milliseconds throughout the childhood with an upper limit of normal of 450 milliseconds. ST segment change uh, not much uh, important in children, just uh, these are the pattern of chill uh, ST segment uh, changes. This up slanting, this down sloping, and horizontal. This down sloping, these are seen in normally in the right precordial lips in the infants due to higher um, uh, uh, right ventricular predominance. Now, some examples of normal is pediatric ECG. Normal 12 lit ECG from three day old baby boy showing. Um, you can see in lead one, small R wave, large S wave. This is a V4R. This is a very tall R wave. In V1, tall R wave with a small S wave. These are the features of right predominance, uh, right ventricular predominance. So, right axis deviation is there. Um, dominant R wave in what I said. So, uh, predominantly upright Q wave in V1. Normal ECG of a one year old children. So here in lead one RS ratio is equal. And it, uh, in V1, you can see there is a tall R wave with a small S wave. It's a down sloping ST segment change due to right ventricular hypertrophy. And in the V5, uh, there is also tall uh, deep S wave. In V6, it has reduced. To, uh, the, uh, to that of normal uh, adult ECG. Uh, and this in lead, uh, age two years old boy, uh, children, in lead one, R wave predominant, small S wave, V1 normal, uh, near towards the normal axis, so it's tall R wave. And in V1, RS ratio almost uh, equal, or R wave is less than S wave. And V5, V6, near to the adult ECG, is more nearer to the adult ECG. In V1, still there is a T inversion with down, uh, it's just like ST change. R wave lesser than S wave. And V5, V6, almost norm, uh, normal adult ECG like that. At 10 years, it's near, almost uh, normal in V1, to V3, all Q waves are upright. And at 12 uh, years of age, the ECG are almost to, of that of adult ECG with the normal axis. <clears throat> Thank you all for patient here. Uh, Thank you, Jamil Bhai. Now, we have learned the basics of a pediatric ECG, what to expect when you see a pediatric ECG. Uh, sometimes when the rate is very rapid, we become confused about the key waves and other things. I want to have the input from uh, if the uh, big data Nuna Fatima Appa is available, she is having a very hectic day because today she will be going abroad and she is having a family gathering at home. Also busy with the tight schedule of his office, of her office. Appa, can you give us some thought? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I am walking and talking to you. Uh, <laughs> so what is it, what was your question? Can you repeat? Uh, sometimes we become confused when the heart rate is very rapid. As we see in the pediatric, you see the heart rate is 120, uh, 115 is common. 
in a, a two month, three month old child. And then how can we be sure he's pathological and not, or less normal? We become confused. No, you know that, thank you. Thank you, Adud, for your nice question. Uh, actually, for the pediatric ECG, there is cutoff point of heart rate for uh, various age groups. So, in this presentation also, Jamil Bhai also uh, showed in his presentation uh, the cutoff points for the heart rate. So, in the neonate up to 150, we consider them as normal. For up to like uh, two years, we consider 125 up to 125 normal then up to four years, uh, like 110. So in this way, there is a, a um, range limit for the heart rate and all the pediatricians, especially pediatric cardiologists, they know about this. So to us, 150 heart rate is a newborn, in a newborn is a normal uh, heart rate. Thank you, Wadud. And fever, uh, let's say uh, it's a three month old child has a fever and we have to do yeah. that to think about if the patient has cardiac is or not. And what, what we, we should we expect? Yeah, in a three month old child, if heart rate is more than 150 and there is fever, and uh, we know that with each uh, degree uh, rise of the fever, there is uh, increase in 10 uh, per minute of the heart rate. So if it is uh, two degree more than that, there will be 20 more than that of the normal age limit. For example, a three months old normal highest limit is 150. If his temperature is like 103, so if we take up to 99 uh, normal, then for rest of the four, uh, this child will have four into 10 uh, equal to 40. So a heart rate will be like 190. So uh, with uh, tachycardia is an, uh, is an acceptable cause, fever is an acceptable cause of tachycardia. So when we see tachycardia in fever, we don't think uh, actually, we, uh, we are not worried that much actually, because in every child with fever, there is tachycardia. But if you are thinking about myocarditis, yes, if, uh, uh, if you think about myocarditis, uh, for example, myocarditis is a viral, um, uh, from the viral uh, infection most of the time, so there is prodrome of viral infection. There is history of uh, calf, running nose, itching in the eye, and something like uh, viral infection. So even in the COVID time, we are getting myocarditis in uh, COVID cases, and most many of the cases are com coming to us with MISC, which is multi-system inflammatory syndrome, and with myocarditis, pericarditis, even with the pancarditis. So if the limit is more than that of the normal, uh, we have to consider all the possible causes. Fever is a symptom, and this symptom may be due to many pathological causes. So first of all, fever may cause tachycardia, but why fever is there? So we should uh, find out the cause of the fever. If the fever is due to myocarditis, if it is myocarditis, then there will be respiratory distress. There will be many other things. So, myocarditis. Thank you. Uh, my point is, uh, in adult, we know that the sinus tachycardia, we do not expect it usually more than 140. It can be up to 160. There's a limit that every node will uh, limit more than that. What is the limit in case of a child? Uh, actually, in uh, as For long as there is P wave in front of every QRS complex, we take all this tachycardia as sinus tachycardia. But uh -huh. if there is no P wave, then we think about supraventricular tachycardia or other kind of tachycardia. But as long as P is there, uh, we never think about other kind of tachycardia. And highest range I have already mentioned. In newborn, it is 150, but not for all the children. For example, if the age of the child is six years, uh, then the range of heart rate is 60 to 100. It's like adult. So if in a six years old child, if heart rate is 150, then it is too high. Yes. His, his range is up to 100. So we know the limit of the uh, of every age and up to six years, uh, after six years, uh, then the rate uh, heart rate is similar to that of the adult. Thank you, Appa. Thank you. Atharpa, I do have a question. So shall I add? 
Yeah, yeah, please, please. Sir, Re there is a rule that 220 minus 18 years, so that would be a highest limit. That 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 has written in some books that 220 minus 18 years. Like, if a child is five years, say, then the maximum sinus rate would be uh, 215. Above that, as, uh, for a five years old child, sinus rate could not be above 215. So this is a rule: the 220 minus 18 years. And also, um, sir, it's not possible to memorize. Uh, uh, in every age, what would be the uh, normal range? So there is a pediatric Z scores. It's available in the net. If you put the date of birth and the heart rate, they will show you the uh, plus uh, two standard to minus two standard devi deviation. I mean the range. So uh, it is uh, easy for you. But for us, even uh, like um, recently, uh, I, I got a call. And they say the child is having pedicardia. So I, I asked that, what is the age of the child? The age of the child was six months. And the child was having uh, post-dengue uh, sub bradycardia. The child's heart rate uh, comes down to 60 to 65. So then I uh, checked with my G-score uh, on the on, uh, internet. And I found that the lowest heart rate would be for a six months old child is 105. So, so in, in that way, we can uh, check the heart rate, whether it is normal or abnormal. Thank you, sir. That's, that's yeah. Because in that case, the pericardia, in that case, oh, yes. much, much higher level that, that should be considered pericardia. Thank you. Yeah, I forgot to mention about the Z-score. Yes, there is a table of Z-score. And with age and uh, heart rate, we can uh, calculate it from the table and then we can see whether it is ready or techy or uh, something else. Thank you. Uh, I wonder sometimes with the techy kind of going on, how do you foresee the echo? It's so rapid movement of the pulse and everything. Only, uh, I, I really, really find it very, very challenging. Yeah, but if you work uh, with the children, then you will be uh, habituated with uh, these things, like us. It's, uh, it's just a habit. If you continue to do something for a long time, you yes. will be used with this. Fido, uh, can I ask uh, uh, also Jahid Bhai and uh, Nahruma, Athol is also here. Do you see any particular pattern uh, in COVID patient, do you have any experience with COVID patient children and their ECG changes, etc.? I'm very curious about that. Uh, we have got a few patient of uh, having a, a different kind of aneurysm, like uh, it uh, can be normal coronary with normal cardiac function, with no tachycardia, means with normal cardiac involvement and can milder to severe form of uh, aneurysm. Uh, we, uh, in this say, uh, setup also, we take the measurement of the coronary and uh, we do the Z-score. If it is more than two standard deviation, then we call uh, dilated. If uh, it more than... Uh, 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 yes. oh, Masin, please, uh, not, yeah, please go on, go on. Uh, uh, there will be aneurysm also, giant aneurysm. We can label it according to Z-score. And uh, well, what is the importance of doing the ECO and ECG on that case that we can start the therapy, specific therapy as early as possible, then it can be uh, reduced, means uh, cardiac function will be uh, not, in, uh, not hampered. Means uh, if we start earlier IVIG, if we get the uh, dilated coronary artery, then the improvement will be good. That one patient I uh, can tell, sir, from the Dhaka Medical College, the patient came, uh, the Z-score is plus six standard deviation and involving left coronary in, in the middle part of the, there is fusiform dilatation and both the right coronary is also seven millimeter, that is six standard deviation. And they also started the therapy as early as possible when uh, they admitted and the marker become normal, but the dilatation, that aneurysm happens, it takes time. And uh, it was uh, reported that this giant aneurysm, this takes a longer time, even one year to two year. 
So we have to assure the parents that it will take time and we have to see the marker, inflammatory marker, and we have to see the, uh, that echocardiographic um, follow-up uh, will be uh, early follow-up, means initially within four to six weeks, and we will follow up the Z-score and the size of the coronary artery and other features of ECG, and also the symptom of the patient. Thus, uh, we can evaluate the patient. Uh, my question is, how do you see the coronaries, through echo or through CAT? So echo, sir. By short axis, we take the aorta and PA and we tilt some anteriorly and bring the uh, coronary arteries, sir. We can well delineated in uh, children, it is well delineated, the coronary artery. We can bring the left origin of the coronary, left main and bifurcation, LAD, LCX, RCA, we can bring these things, sir. If there is too distal, then sometimes if we think that distal portion can be, we can take the CT angiogram or cardiac cath, we can do, but in ECO, we can delineate, sir. Uh, I, I have a question uh, to Jahid Bhai, but sometimes I see the persistence of pattern in young kids around, the, let's say, 15 or 16 years old. We know that it can persist, but most of the kids that I see are female. I really see that in case of a male child. What are your experience and your take on that? Uh, what is your question? Uh, juvenile persistence of juvenile pattern of key inversion in V1 to V3 or V4 that persist at 16 years or 16 years. Uh, mostly I see that in case of females and less commonly in case of males. What is your experience and what is the explanation? Uh, no, the, uh, we have said that uh, Jamil has nicely presented, uh, shown his in presentation that uh, there could be a tear of inversion up to certain uh, age of the children. But uh, in case of female, there could be also the uh, tear of inversion. Uh, at this moment, I do not know uh, exact explanation of this, whether anybody can end an aroma or professor begin in or Patama, the tear of inversion in female. Uh, but uh, in case of children, uh, up to uh, uh, 12 years of age, there can be juvenile pattern T inversion. Sometimes adult cardiologists uh, uh, reported that ischemic, ischemic origin, but this is normal for children. So we, we write down it as juvenile pattern ECG, okay? Exactly. Exactly. But do you have on that? Because I mostly female children having that, but male child less commonly so. Uh, actually, I don't uh, know the reason about, of the female. I don't know whether other boy may know the reason. But uh, actually, it can persist in children up to, we see, up to 16 years of age, up to 18 years of age. But uh, sometimes we also see that uh, there is juvenile pattern of uh, T wave in the ECG in females. Uh, I, I don't know what is the reason. I just want to add something with the Nahroma's um, uh, comments on uh, coronary arteries in Kawasaki disease. Actually, uh, it is a finding in the Kawasaki disease, but in COVID era, we are getting some of the patient with Kawasaki-like diseases, where there is changes in the coronary arteries. So what happened initially, there is coronary dilatation because of the change of the intima and media. And if we can diagnose that at the very early stage, and if we give IBIG or intravenous immunoglobulin, we can reverse that change. But if there is aneurysm, then it will not help that much, and uh, that aneurysm take long time, uh, time, time to recover. What happened within this aneurysm, if there is any thrombus formation, as there is stasis of the blood, uh, there is chance of thrombus formation. And this is the only cause of heart attack or acute MI in children. So they will present with the acute MI, and they, their ECG finding will then be like that of your MI, with a ST segment changes and T inversion like this. So uh, this is the only case and uh, in some other cases of anomalous origin of left coronary artery from the main pulmonary artery, there is some evidence of ischemia, but this is the only classical case of ischemia and infarction in children. Thank you, Dr. Wadud. Wadud, I'd like to uh, add something to your question. Uh, there is a persistence of the T wave inversion. I can mention the reference, but I found somewhere that that may be the influence of the female hormones. 
uh, that causes this Q wave inversion in the ECGs. Um, uh, that's a um, uh, estrogen progesterone effect, as well as uh, as the females are more emotional from the early childhood. So that has also an influence, even in adult uh, female who are very much emotional and emotional uh, during uh, is taken during the emotional outburst. There is widespread T wave inversion in um, uh, pectoral lids without in having any coronary artery disease. So these are, are actually very difficult to explain. Thank you, Jamil sir. Uh, we have put some questions in the chat box. Uh, one question is. In long QT syndrome, how you will diagnose it in increased heart rate in baby? Or how can you diagnose long QT in pediatric case? Kiros. Is there anything special? Hello, Sir. Kiros. Sir. I think uh, today's discussion is on the normal. Oh, normal. Yes. I think uh, the uh, oh, okay, coming Sir. Saturday. So, although there is a question, you just concentrate your discussion about the normal pediatric issue. That is a big chapter. Normal issues is a very big chapter. I think this is a great occasion today that we have got the, uh, the all the renowned pediatric cardiologists here. So let us try to draw a conclusion about the normal pattern of ECG, pediatric ECG. Thank you, sir. There is another question. Uh, placement of V4R lead. Up to which is the V4R should be uh, placed on the right side? Up to five, five years. Up to five years, sir. Yeah. <coughs> Today I first know about this. I didn't know about it at all. <laughs> I didn't know also. Well, well for, uh, I really, learned during really, preparing the lecture. Really, actually, this is a learning day for us. We are the <laughs> we deal with adult <laughs> pediatric but the, this is uh, many things are actually about the heart rate. What Riva actually added that is the how to calculate the heart rate. Sometimes the pediatric patients are referred to us. But this is a really, uh, we are learning many things about the placement of the V4R and calculating of the heart rate. Then, Firoz, other question. Uh, another question from Dr. Novin Sheikh. Uh, whether there is any difference in the ECG between premature infants and full-term newborn? Yes, yes. Yes, there is difference. Shall I answer or anybody else will answer? Yes, madam, you can answer. Please, madam. please. Okay, after this question, I will leave if you can allow me okay, because sure. Sure. Uh, uh, in premature, we know that in normal infant, normal uh, newborn baby, there is right ventricular predominance uh, because of the uh, influence of the fetal circulation. Right ventricle maintains the systemic circulation through the patent ductus arteriosus in the normal newborn. But if the delivery is little bit earlier, like in 32 weeks or 34 weeks, in those babies, there is left ventricular uh, predominance. So in uh, so in preterm babies, we see left ventricular force. But uh, once they progress towards the time of their delivery, they they convert it to the right ventricular force. And by uh, six months, and sometimes it takes uh, about one to two years to become to the left ventricular force. So this is the transitional time of the uh, ECG. So at birth, uh, if the child is premature, it is left ventricular force. If the child is normal newborn, it is right ventricular force. And then uh, within six months of age, right ventricle uh, uh, pressure become normal and then ECG pattern change. And at certain age, like up to six months to one year, in this period, both LB and RB, they remain similar, same force. And afterwards, LB start taking uh, uh, the dominant part. So after that, the LV force will be dominant. So this is the normal pattern in the uh, children in transitional period. So thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, and I, I'm thank leaving, you to, leaving tomorrow. So please pray for me so that I can uh, come back to have you have safely. Have a safe trip. Have a safe thank, trip you. thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I want to be for the whole end. And, uh, <laughs> the uh, children and the infant and adult, the electrode of the ECG is same or different? Electrodes, um, 
Actually, I did never recorded a pediatric ECG. So I don't know the question, uh, answer of this question. Uh, a pediatrician might answer it. Uh, we do, sir. Uh, there is a difference in the size of the electrode that we practice adhesive electrode. And uh, in it is a finding newborn, infant, and adolescent. The price is a little bit higher for the newborn and uh, infant uh, than adult. And uh, that is also very important, sir, because uh, if we don't put in a uh, uh, very keen way, then uh, the chamber that read out from the heart, it will be not proper. So to uh, keep the proper in a proper site, it is very important. And also it is sir, just, it is very important for a pediatrician or pediatric ECG that baby has to be calm and quiet because sometimes uh, uh, we don't get on that time, it can be misleading for us, sir. So uh, those baby who are not cooperative, we try to uh, breastfeed the baby and to become the calm and quiet and then place the EC EC electrode cell. I, I've got a very simple question for you. What are the indications of pediatric ECG? Uh, in which condition do you refer for a ECG? In uh, every patient, those who are complaining that chest pain, respiratory distress, uh, palpitation, any type of any sort of complaint, Regular. cardiac evaluation, then we do a ECG at least. So you depend on the ECG for uh, evaluation of ketamine birth size. Sorry. Been, how much information do you get from ECG regarding the chamber enlargement, like ventricular enlargement, right ventricular enlargement, left ventricular enlargement, because you are going through a period of transition at but then six months, six years, then again, how much it is helpful? The uh, yeah, yeah. Definitely I, it is helpful to by the ECG to see the chamber enlargement and you can confirm it uh, by echocardiography. So no doubt. Yeah. That is yeah. what I was asking it about. Is also yes, sir. You depend can on I, it. As a, can I add to Firoz's question? Firoz? Yes, sir. As a, I can, Naharuma, actually, now what the uh, Firoz wants to know, there are some special indications. The same bar size, same bar dimension, same bar hypertrophy are the not the proper usual indication for the ECG in pediatric ECG as because there are eco. But there are some specific conditions where the ECG is very important for decision making. Exactly. Like any characters of the carditis, like the rheumatic carditis, myocarditis, pericarditis, congenital yes. heart disease, post-operative status, very much important post-operative status, ECG with the electrolyte imbalance. So, the indications are almost similar. Only difference that is, it is less important for the stage pain evaluation, like the uh, same bar dimension, same bar hypertrophy. But carditis, pericarditis, myocarditis, post-operative, cyanosis, congenital heart disease, these are the very much useful indications for the pediatric. Yes. So yes. ECG is very much tremendously important in case of the pediatric ECG, particularly yeah, yeah, yeah. these kinds of the indication. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can I? Uh, yeah. oh, but there is ST elevation in case of adult, it's a normal variation, isn't it? And is there something similar in case of it? Rima, do you want to answer that? So, sorry, sir, I, I didn't. Early repolarization is a feature where there is ST elevation, but there's actually benign condition. We find that in adults. Is there anything like that in case of children? Sir, we don't get uh, much uh, ST elevation unless the child is in uh, some uh, uh, drugs like uh, anti failure drugs, decongestive drugs, uh, or uh, there is some electrolyte imbalance, decoxin toxicity. And normally, we don't get uh, much uh, ST changes in pediatric age group. I don't have, uh, I, I have not seen much ST changes unless. There is an underlying congenital heart disease having getting uh, some uh, anti paleo medicine or some there is some electrolyte imbalance. Those patients, we sometimes get this. this. Sir, I, I just want to add one thing that uh, uh, most, most of the cases, pediatrician uh, sent to us uh, for ECG after getting an ECG because the ECGs uh, are calibrated in an adult machine. So they, uh, they, they will write like non-specific findings, short PR intervals. So they, they get uh, confused those. Uh, so that's, that, that is a problem. Like 
for a for a three years old child, PR interval is uh, will be written short PR interval in a an in an adult machine. But this is normal for that child. We have to uh, we have to counsel the parents. So we have to assure the child. So a lot of times we have seen that pediatricians send us uh, send us a child because the interpretation that has written in the ECGs and sometimes some curious patient uh, came to us uh, and they said that, that that the ECG has written something that is actually uh, not true for a uh, pediatric patient. Uh, that's a problem. Yes, so okay. Professor Udu Chudri, Professor Atali is a renowned uh, yeah. But what I want to mention is the short peer interval and incomplete RP. This is the normal period. If there is no, this is the normal period. Exactly. We should know this. That this is the normal period. The patient is asymptomatic with no other underlying pathology. Uh, they, this, is, this is the normal period, and we shall counsel the parents accordingly. Thank you, Jai Bhai. Actually, this is the main objective of today's discussion. What are the yeah. acceptable abnormalities of the pediatric ECG? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. all the, like the heart rate, what is actually discussed already by Rima and the, uh, our madam. The, yeah, yeah. The, like, we should uh, make it, uh, uh, draw a conclusion about the other parameters. So, about the, about the intervals, all the intervals are less, like the PR interval, QR, uh, that is QRS yes. interval, yes. Uh, Q interval, all the intervals are less in case of the pediatric interval. So starting from the infancy until adulthood, the intervals are gradually increases and at the adult, it uh, becomes the adult size. So it is a normal physiology. That is the, all the yeah, intervals yeah, yeah. are less. All the, the, the less the size of the children, the less the interval of the QR, less the interval of the PR. It is acceptable. So this is about. So I want to do uh, another thing from Naharuma or the Rima. Axis calculation is very much important in case of the adult. And we know the axis changes in case of the pediatric ECG. Just after the born, it is the right axis deviation. Gradually, the axis changes. At some age, it becomes the equal, and then it becomes the left-sided. So is there any importance of knowing axis, changes, axis calculation in the pediatric ECG? Is there any importance? It is very important, sir. Because uh, Sir has shown, German Sir has shown that uh, at birth it is axis around 110. They have right axis deviation with right ventricular hypertrophy. So how should a clinician will judge that this patient has tetralogy of, by ECG, tetralogy of fellow or critical PS? Because that is also right axis deviation with right ventricular hypertrophy, sir. But what happened in that cases that uh, the axis will be at least more than 120 degrees. And there will be monophasic Q wave in V1. And there will be turn in V1. So these are the indicator point where we can differ from a normal newborn uh, ECG from a uh, uh, right axis deviation of tetralogy of fallot or other. And another important thing, sir, that we tell sinus arrhythmia, sinus rhythm is normal. But uh, each P, uh, P is, uh, uh, there will be, be of, uh, before a QRS complex, but we have to see the axis of the P. If it is a normal P axis, then it will be sinus rhythm. But if it, the P is not a normal axis, it is coming from the left side or from the coronary side, then we should not label it as a uh, sinus rhythm. We see, have to see the P axis, another important thing to determine the situs of the patient. Because uh, if it is coming from the right shoulder towards the uh, AV node, then it will be normal axis. So we have to see the P axis, we have to see the QRS axis, and we have to determine the normal axis of the child. Sir. Now, can I make a tafsir of that? Yes. Sir. When you P axis are other things, but please translate it into general calculation. The thing is, if you get a positive P wave, you lead one and lead two, normal P. Yes. Positive P wave in lead one and lead two is normal P. And another thing about that, in case of children, the P wave will be a little bit picked. A little yes. bit P wave do not mean that they have P pulmonary. It's very normal for that can have because the chest wall is so thin, it can have a higher size P wave. The P wave amplitude could be up to three millimeter normally in case of children. Am I right? Yes. Uh, yes. Usually, uh, sir, so two, uh, two point uh, five to three. What I, show, I showed in my lecture that 
but I, height listen. is maximum three millimeter. Yeah. And if it is more than that and thick, then uh, uh, this uh, right axial hypertrophy should be thinker. The axis, axis is very important. P axis yes. we yes. have to uh, we have to see for the sinus to declare the sinus. Yes. Another thing is that sometimes in case of a let's say a ten year old boy, uh, we have big complexes. But most of the time, I find that that boy is actually very lean and thin. That's why we are having big complexes. They are supposed to be transitioning into no adult type ECG, but having a bigger complex, a little bit more. Uh, is it normal? Almost in six to eight years, the ECG will be almost like an adult, sir. So for a ten years, that uh, complex will be at um, uh, like an adult, sir. Adult, right. Thin, tall adult can have, uh, I mean, because the muscle mass and all those. Yeah. Uh, sir, actually, uh, actually, actually our... in, in adults also, we find those are who are very lean and thin and chest wall thickness is very less. They have very tall um, R web, tall T webs like that. But uh, in echo, it's almost normal. So the chest wall thickness is very important for determining the amplitude of the QRS complex. So thank you, Naruma, for your excellent input. Rima, I want to know one thing from you. In adult, the QT interval is very much important in case of pediatric ECG. I think as because QT is a congenital problem sometimes. So in adult ECG evaluation, we have got some rule of thumb about predicting about the QT abnormalities. In pediatric ECG, do you have any specialty about the QT interval for sir, evaluating we, the pediatric we, ECG? Yes, sir. Uh, we we used to teach our uh, residents like that, that when we you scan an ECG, you check if the uh, if the uh, QT interval is equal half or more than half of RR interval, then there is a chance of uh, QT prolongation. So in that case, uh, you should uh, check the QTC, uh, especially uh, sir, uh, you know that uh, in the newborn uh, the QT prolong uh, QT prolongation came as bradycardia. So I used to ask the uh, resident or the uh, fellow that uh, please calculate the QTC and let me know. Uh, and also sometimes some uh, hypocalcemia, hypokalemia situation, there will be some QT prolongation. So all those cases uh, we used to ask. And, uh, and unfortunately, after a post-graduation, also a, a, a student cannot, uh, a post-graduate also cannot uh, calculate the QTC. Uh, even an FCPS, uh, uh, register. I have to. I. I. I uh, this just. I got a call from uh, ICU, and they say that the child, the new is having bradycardia. What is what is the heart rate? Uh, 70, 80. So this is bradycardia, of, of, of course. So first thing came into my mind is 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 there is a long QT syndrome, or is there is hypocalcemia, hypoca hypokalemia, or any electrolyte imbalance? They said no, calcium and all those they have to check then i said then okay uh, calculate the qtc and uh, tell me and they are unable to uh, calculate the qtc so we we i used to i used to uh, ask our uh, uh, resident that please uh, uh, when when they when they come to our block for three months duration so i used to say that please uh, 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 take 10 ecgs and uh, calculate pr interval qtc rate axis so in that in that way they can uh, uh, calculate and uh, there is some lot of importance. So first thing is scan the ECG and check if the QT interval is equal to more than half of uh, other interval. Then uh, they should uh, actually uh, check the uh, QTC or uh, calculate the QTC. Thank you, Riva. Firoz, possibly we have got ABA uh, Abdul Salam, Professor ABA Abdul Salam, Ataul Hawk with us. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. I think hey, Salamba is, hey, is there. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, is not there. Thank you very much. Yeah. All both Jaki, there. Yeah. yeah, excellent discussion. Yeah. I enjoyed your lecture, Jamil sir. Abdul Salam sir, uh, please. Yeah, yeah. Many things I was not knowing. I learned from you. And actually, in an ICBD, what was our Privilege as well as uh, disprivilege uh, during our practice in NICBD because we had uh, the EP department like Atanali, Mohsin, and you are also there. 
So uh, almost uh, whenever we got any abnormal ECG or abnormal arrhythmia, either bradyo or tachy, we used to refer to you. So our practice is less. So any question regarding uh, regarding ECG to me or me, uh, which I can supplement. The one thing important that is the hypertrophy, that is chamber dimension below one year. Uh, uh, ROF plus SOF in V1 or V2 plus or V plus V5 or V6 uh, should uh, should be less than one year should be 40 millimeter and after one year it should be up to five, uh, three years it is 35 millimeter it is hypertrophy and the regarding the QRS uh, configuration it may be only QR it may be only QS it may be Q, uh, QRS uh, dash or QR uh, da, uh, QSR uh, dash then so morphological change may be there. The problem is uh, in the uh, periodic ECG recording the in which state you are doing uh, as uh, Dr. Firoz was asking you what are the indication you usually uh, find uh, uh, to do the ECG in periodic patient. Whenever any pediatric patient comes to us, we used to uh, monitor the hemodynamic status, including the heart rate. When we find there is a, a significant bradycardia, or tachycardia, or tachyarrhythmia, so in that case, we usually go for, uh, particularly in ICU setting, when we put onto the monitor, we used to attach with a um, ECG lead. So when there is fasting ECG rate, and the patient is having tachycardia, tachypnea, enlarged tender liver, so uh, and also basal crepes. We used to think of heart failure. So why this heart failure? It is due to myocarditis, or due to cardiomyopathy, or due to something other structural heart disease. Then we used to go for uh, echocardiography. And uh, a lot of uh, bradyarrhythmia we used to found in our practice, and uh, particularly. Um, uh, that uh, uh, congenital heart block, congenital heart block, uh, second degree Mobius type two, as well as uh, uh, third degree heart heart block, and uh, tachyarrhythmia most commonly tachy that is SBT. Actually, today's discussion was with normal ECG. Okay, so uh, it was wonderful discussion. I really enjoyed from you all of you, particularly Adu sir, uh, as well as Jamil sir and. I must uh, thanks to the organizer for uh, uh, initiating this uh, and conducting these uh, courses. Thank you very much, sir. Atarvai. Hello. Hello. At Atarvai. Yeah, Sorun Maski. Yeah, there are two pediatric cardiologists who have joined. It's in panel, Manis, Dr. Manish Shrestha and Urmila Sakya. Can you take opinion from them too? Sure, sure, sure. As a Firoz. Sir, as a, here is Dr. Sakya. There are two cardiologists from Nepal. Firoz. Yes, sir. Dr. Dr. Jakia. Dr. Jakia, State Professor of Pediatric Cardiology and ICBD. Please, your opinion. Please unmute yourself. Dr. Jakia. Jakia, unmute, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, actually, it was a very nice talk and discussion was very informative and uh, detailed discussion was done. And I have actually, I have very little experience regarding the pediatric ECG. And uh, we have learned lots of things from this and uh, from the uh, discussion as well as from presentation. So <laughs> thank you, organizer, for arranging such a nice um, uh, webinar regarding the pediatric ECG. We actually uh, uh, don't have such a nice uh, ECG presentation before that. So thank you all, sir. Thank you. Thank I you hope to much. see you next Saturday, Zakia. I hope to next, yes, next Saturday. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, we will yes, from Nepal. Okay, okay. Yeah. Hello, hello. I'm Dr. Urmila yes. Sahib. Okay. I'm very glad to uh, participate today's this program. It's very nice and it's very thoroughly from the uh, very starting pediatrician. It's very very important. And in the most of the time, yeah, it's very true that uh, adult ECG is totally uh, in the initial uh, phases of the child is totally different. So from the every age group it will be different so that is very important factor we don't have to forget about that when we interpret the pediatric ECG so it's very useful today's program and I'm very glad thank you for this nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
see you next uh, uh, Saturday again. Dr. Monish, with it, are you with us, Dr. Monish? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, good evening. Can you uh, show your video, oh, Manish? Oh, open your video, please, Manish. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see yeah. me now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. I can see you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, letting me uh, to say some of my words. It's uh, indeed I uh, enjoyed uh, each each of the every words of the presentation. It's very nice. Uh, yeah, the, everyone has in, uh, put their efforts um, that uh, to make our child child better, because uh, everybody is knowing the importance of ECG in children also nowadays. Uh, because um, yeah, like uh, everything, like we don't have the set values like in adults. Like adults have the set values like the bradycardia, the tachycardia, everything. But pediatrics, we have the different in uh, in age. So we have the normograms, we have the G scores. So everybody has pointed out the space, uh, little little things. So I enjoy it a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, hope to see you next time. Yes. yes. Thank you, Monish. Uh, welcome you the next Saturday. Next Saturday. Sure, sure. Yeah, Dr. Ataul, Dr. Ataul, how? Ataul, you are Yes, sir. I am here, sir. Ataul, video on, please. Open your camera. Okay, a second. No, get the Hey, Ataul, your experience with pediatric is easy. Sir, it was really very much enjoyable uh, discussion today, especially Atahari sir, Wadud sir, Jahid sir, Piroz bhai, and uh, Dr. Naharuma, Dr. Rima, everybody participate and enrich the discussion uh, very much. Sir, I enjoyed very much. Uh, I think it will be very much helpful for uh, both adult and pediatric cardiologists. Uh, actually, sir, uh, in pediatric <coughs> cardiology, uh, ECG is very much important for the diagnosis and uh, uh, especially some uh, post-procedural cases, sir, like in case of ASD, sir, uh, uh, we do routine ECG for any degree of heart block. Uh, uh, and so many cases also ECG give us important clues for diagnosis. So we should learn ECG, especially uh, especially uh, in, in few cases, uh, it helped us it uh, very much. Uh, so I think uh, we need to learn more about ECG. And uh, uh, in, uh, in ICBD, sir, I think if uh, EP department organize some ECG classes for pediatric cardiology department and uh, to more helpful for a special officer, Dr. Tushar. Uh, I think I will organize some uh, with Dr. Shadir Bhai, organize some classes or some discussion for our more development in ECG. Thank you, sir, for uh, this uh, uh, webinar today. Thank you for uh, Thank you, all, all organizers. Thank you, Dr. Hope, hope you will be with us in the next session also. Heroes. Yes, sir. Heroes, when I just, uh, before going to next session, our uh, Professor Zahid Hussain Bhai, I, 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 I think we should take some yeah. comments from Professor Zahid Hussain Bhai. Hello. Yes, sir. Zahid Bhai, are your final comment, please? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Atoli, for giving the words. Actually, uh, we are pediatric cardiologists. Uh, Professor Naruma, Dr. Dejunia, Brigade Dunar, Professor, nicely interacted uh, with the presentation made by Dr. Uh, Abdullah Jamin and also the questions raised by Professor Wadu and others. Actually, uh, it is the, the first and foremost tool to diagnose congenital heart disease. But uh, uh, today's presentation by adult cardiologist, particularly uh, Dr. Abdullah Jamil, has invoked uh, the interest among us uh, to uh, to arrange uh, the lecture on periodic ECG. Because if you don't practice, uh, everything uh, would not remain in your uh, in your head. And it is a day-to-day -day practice. It will make, make you perfect. So uh, by this time, I, I also uh, arrange some important uh, webinar uh, 
uh, our sell by the foreign expert. Uh, yesterday we have also had a uh, Zoom lecture by Wall from Aspiritic Cardinalis, Parkutitas Formula Diplomacy with Jayadil Hazaji. But uh, ECG is the, is the fundamental tool to diagnose congenital and other cardiac diseases. Uh, so we have to uh, very much, uh, uh, what I should say that uh, we should be familiar, we should be uh, uh, we should, uh, knowledgeable in interpre interpreting ECG. But uh, but uh, Dr. Nabin Shagat asked, uh, ECG of a premature baby, ECG of a newborn, and up to the adult. So I think today's presentation has been very, very nice. Uh, being an adult cardiologist, Dr. Abdullah Jamil has nicely presented the pediatric topic, and our pediatric cardiologist has nicely interacted. I think uh, we, the cardiologist, whether pediatric or adult, if we work together, together and arrange such type of, uh, such type of lecture, our, we, with the doctors, our students, and our patients, all will be benefited with these few words. Again, I want to give the uh, thanks and gratitude to the organizer for inviting me to join to this program. Uh, thank you all. Jahid bhai, aapna ke ogrin dawar dichhi agami shabtar tar jinnno. Achoo, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Radhud. Actually, I was busy, so I, okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, I must attend. Okay. I think the, the most important message our attendants will take after this class that the pediatric ECG is a different thing. It has got different standards, it has got different uh, uh, importance, and it should not be always uh, uh, just by the adult parameters. That is a, a one important thing. And uh, I hope hopefully practice and learning the abnormal ECG in the next class or in the future life can help them. Um, we can go for our next part of the session, sir. Otherwise, sir? Yes. We, we can go. And uh, uh, please, uh, Rima Naharma, you can stay with us. Our adult section, that is the next session. Uh, that, that is a wonderful presentation by Orun Maskir from Nepal. Please stay with us. Jai Bhai, please. OK, yes. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. We are seeing you, but cannot hear anything from you. Oru, we have unmute. Oru, unmute, please. Unmute. Oru, unmute. Dr. Oru, please unmute yourself. Dr. Oru, unmute, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah fine. Oh, okay. from the Please start from, the, from beginning. the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Wadud and Dr. Atar. Is uh, this is a ECG session? So I came across one very interesting ECG finding. I think this should be helpful to all our participants. So my topic is: Is this ECG or true STEMI? This is a 54 years old gentleman. He's a relative of uh, one of my uh, cardiology colleague. He's a known hypertension and diabetic, diabetes and well controlled. He was referred from other hospital with the history of severe retrospiratory chest pain associated with sweating. So this patient was thought as a case of uh, acute myocardial infarction. He was transferred with loading dose of aspirin, 300, clobidogrel 600, and as the patient had severe chest pain, he was given injection morphine two gram IV and referred as a STEMI for primary PCIs. So this is a baseline ECG of the patient. So now I would be happy to get opinion from our learned panelists. So is this uh, ECG a STEMI? So he has a typical ischemic chest pain, 54 years old, diabetes and hypertension. And based on this ECG, can we label this as a STEMI and go and do primary PCI, angiogram and primary PCI? That's what uh, first question was. Can I uh, say something? Yes, sir. Yeah. To me, it seems uh, in the pectoral leads, the J points are elevated and the ST segment is scoped 
upwards not convexity upwards uh, from uh, v2 v1 to v4 uh, is like that and uh, it seems it's not true as the elevation it's a j point elevation okay thank you so open in from any other uh, analyst vadu dan mute please vadu dan mute whether the patient had uh, ischemic type chest pain or not yeah yeah classical i mean so yeah. this patient was referred from other hospital and the colleague of my who is a cardiologist has not seen so they went to one of the hospital and and after the patient came we asked his he said typical left sided retrosternal chest pain associated with sweating so okay. history looks like a ischemic pain it's no problem as a typical as a can you, can you make a comment that is the uh, starting of the chest pain and the taking of the ecg what was the difference between the onset of the timing no 3 hours of chest pain he attended the uh, hospital one of the hospital and that time he was having severe retrosternal from chest pain with sweating that is this uh, this ecg was taken after 3 yeah. hours chest pain yeah yeah he attended the uh, emergency in one of the hospital and this was the ecg during chest pain can i add something some of the students are answering that this is a nasty elevated mi acute hyperacute mi don't sign create a sign when it is not there it's better to omit than commit something wrong then this is not an st elevation ecg this is a case of yes. Acute, yes acute coronary syndrome but please do not make a sign when it is not there i would be really really furious with the students you should take the patient consider this a case of acute coronary syndrome you should give all the medication take the patient to the cath lab but do not say this is an st elevated mi already person jani has already answered very nicely why he is saying so look at the second ecg again no it's not there if there is any reciprocal change in the inferior walls i would have accepted that this could be ischemic this is not uh, i would what would i to like to add something with you yeah the uh, even with a transmural in part yes there may be no ecg change yes uh, to... and this patient might have acute mi without having any ecg change up to 40% of patients Prince. do not have ecg change with acute mi so we will be needing uh, uh, the the result of classic uh, class cardiac marker if that is elevated and the typical chest pain so then we can label it as non st elevation mi and treat accordingly if i get this ecg and with this background the first question i'll be asking is there any previous ecg available i want to compare yeah, it yeah, oh, yeah, no, sure, no sure. there is no previous ecg to compare and number 2 i'll go for an echo i want to see the echo of this patient and also the tropi because three hours chest pain after two hours tropi may be elevated i want to go for that but i would consider this a case of ac scs because yes, the i said i high sensitive tropi would be um, uh, positive by 3 hours yeah, high, high sensitive troponin is not available in country so that's out of question okay okay echo or okay also so then we can have oh, serial serial troponin uh, after 1 okay. hour so in the uh, this patient was in emergency now he complains of slight chest pain the pain chest pain has markedly reduced maybe because of morphine He is a uh, pulse was eighty four, blood pressure one thirty by eighty, chest is clear, and he gives history that one year back he has done SCG echo and treadmill, which is normal. Was he on aspirin? Was yeah. aspirin? No, he was given. He was not on aspirin. So this is a second SCG when he came. Uh, the the SCG was repeated at the emergency. Now this thing something changing. There is dynamic in the ST segment. And uh, Orun, can I ask something? Yeah, yeah. In guideline, uh, at what interval you should repeat ECG in such cases? Oh, uh, they do not exactly say uh, how many minutes, but they say 
uh, at, uh, we have to take ECG monitor continuously and take ECG at regular intervals. It is so regular, maybe around 15 minutes. And then suggest around 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. We have to repeat ECG. This is the ECG. How long, how, how long after this ECG was taken from no, the No, no, this patient, it, it took around, let's, uh, uh, around half of 25 to 30 minutes to come to hospital. And okay. this is a uh, second ECG after 30 minutes, let's say 25 30 to 30 minutes in emergency. So there is sub subtle change subtle in the changes, segment, but, yeah. but not definite. Not very convincing. Not, not and very after convincing. 15 minutes, this was a uh, second ECG, which was uh, repeated. It's almost yes. same, the second one. Yeah, almost uh, same. Yeah. And we thought it could be a posterior infarction, which is often missed. And yeah. Yeah. This is a V7, V8, and V9. So, okay. so not, not much of change. Not much change, no. And uh, we repeated echo uh, in the emergency. Uh, his action fraction was normal, and there was no regional wall motion and maltese. That is the... Yeah. So now the patient has no chest pain. ECG has some subtle changes. Classical ECG changes, diabetic and hypertensive, 54 years old gentleman coming in the emergency. So what should we do? Because echo is normal. Is it acute coronary syndrome? Second is... Uh, uh, for, for, for determining acute coronary, now the cardiac markers are important. Troponin yeah. or CKMB. So should we wait for uh, troponins to confirm acute coronary syndrome? And the other option is, yeah. should we just observe the patient, take serial ECG? Yeah. Take it as a non ST elevation MI and give low molecular weight heparin. Or can we take as an evolving MI, do early angiogram and do PCI if suitable? These are the concerns. So, one concern was whether we are dealing with uh, aortic dissection. So, did an echo just to rule out flap. There was no flap. So, that and symptoms was not very suggestive, hemodynamically stable. So, this. Uh, aortic dissection was excluded. So these are the points which uh, we were discussing. So if you send enzymes... A another, uh, Arun, another yeah. import, Arun, another point, um, uh, a very important differential diagnosis is esophageal spasm. That is similar retrosternal pain uh, radiates to the left arm and have sweating. So uh, in that case also, this kind of decision might uh, show and uh, very confusing. And even that pain subsides with uh, sub sublingual visceral trinitrate spray uh, as the spasm goes off with the he was, spray. He was not given so nitrates, he was just given morphine. Also. Okay. Uh, uh, Jamil, Ji. actually, uh, with the history of the typical ischemic type of chest pain, if we compare the ECG number one and ECG number two, the diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome as Sudhuri added, I must think we should treat the patient as the acute coronary syndrome. We can exclude. We can exclude yeah. the yeah. infection. We can exclude the spasm. But this should be the working first diagnosis that yeah, is sure. acute coronary that, syndrome. You just see the ECG be first and second ECG. There is that, that we have taken, the recent SES. Then we are discussing about the DD. Uh, the, the question is, do you want to take the patient to the cat lab or not? Yes. I would. I would. If the facility available, I would want to. Yes, I always support. That is in presence of the chest pain in a diabetic and hypertensive patient, ischemic type uh, of And they comparing the first... According to... Uh, although according to guideline, uh, it does not fulfill the criteria of STEMI. So... I am not in favor of uh, doing primary, but I will do second or on, on second or third day, early invasive, but not primary. We are not talking about primary. We are talking about taking to the patient to the cath lab. You have now. diagnosis. Not now. I, I, I like to exclude other things. May I say to add something? Look at the uh, risk profile. This is the main person, more than 50 years old, he is hypertensive, he is diabetic, he was very stable previously, now having severe typical retrosternal chest pain that has been relieved by after giving antiplatelets, loading dose, along with uh, heparin and morphine. All this suggests the treatment 
the pre risk factor profile such as this is a case of scs is it the is def definitely scs but if it's not achha, stemi achha, uh, achha, uh, not achha. not yeah. Arun, um, uh, Arun, can you show the second ecg again please डिसेंडिंग लूप ऑफ दी Yeah. Yeah. Can I add something? Always assess ST segment, ST millisecond from the junction. If you assess the millisecond from the junction, the ST is definitely elevated. And from the previous CCG, the concavity is lost. It's now concave. Elevated, but it's uh, it's convex. Upslanting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You also please note the R wave changes from V1 to V5. V6 wave, S6 wave. The look at this V6 R wave height is reduced. That's another sign. The third is this. And may I ask a question, sir? For what, sure, sir? Sure. Yeah. Prove that this is not a STEMI yet. Now. No, not yet. STEMI is a differential diagnosis in this case. So yeah. If it is, if we, we cannot say that it is a STEMI, there is no way it is a primary PCI. Second, no, it's primary PCI. It's a SCS. That means it is either an unstable angina or non-STMI. Yes. That, yes. For braces, pouring the patient with the no hemodynamic change, no pain after the morphine, patient is not getting uh, any aspirin or anti-platelet drug previously. Echocardiography is normal. This is a low risk score. So you can go for cat cardiac cath lab, but cardiac cath lab is not a mandatory. Not a exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it is not class one indication or even class two uh, A. It may be class two B or less. Exactly. Point exactly. that this is a very important point because you have treated SCS, but if the only the facilities are available, only then you go for cath lab. Otherwise, it's not a must. But you have treated the SCS, that will do. But it will be within your right to do the proper if you do to give the conservative treatment. Uh, Loading aspirin. Hey, and, only, uh, uh, only. No molecular weight heparin should be started. Okay. So, Next. So why uh, this uh, MI is important? It's time is money. If you do early, you salvage myocardial cardium and the mortality is reduced. Already uh, proven. So another is why I was saying why this is STEMI is if you think this is a hyperacute T waves. Evolving MI. If you think it's a STEMI, then door to wire crossing time should be within 60 minutes, which is very important. Now, new guideline says if you think of non-ST elevation MI, if you think of very high risks like hemodynamic instability, cardiogenic shock, refractory chest pain, life-threatening arrhythmia, mechanical complication, acute heart failure, or ST depression more than one millimeter in more than six leads, plus ST elevation in AVR or V1. These are very high risk category in uh, non-ST elevation MI, and then angiogram should be done within two hours. But if it's a non-ST elevation MI, dynamic changes, dissociate cardiac arrest, and risk score is more than 140, then early invasive therapy within 24 hours is indicated. So this guy will not need any early invasive uh, strategy. In low risk patients, they can be, they do not require require any. Cats. So this is a current now anesthetic guideline in uh, this patient. So after a long uh, discussion with my friend, and so I thought I'm convinced this patient has uh, some ischemic symptoms, diabetic and hypertension. So it could be evolving MI because the cath lab in emergency is hardly uh, uh, 30 meters. It takes around five minutes for me to take to the cath lab, and cath lab is. Stand by 24 hours. So I thought it was an evolving MI based on history and diabetic profile. Did an angiogram in this patient. The right was normal. And if you look at this uh, angiogram, circumflex is normal, and there's an occluded mid LAD. That's nice. 
and uh, so this patient underwent uh, angioplasty with uh, drug leaking stents. So post dilated, I'm not going into detail. So this was a final pictures and took him to the uh, coronary care unit and did an repeat an ECG after one hour. So this is an ECG in this patient. So any comments? So still the changes of acute anterior volume has not come in this patient. Based on this ECG, it's very difficult to say after doing PCI in occluded mid LED, open the artery, and this is uh, four hours after chest pain. And did, sorry. Our wave has reduced Yes, Father? Was there any retrofilling of the LED? No, there's no retrofilling. That means it's an acute closer. A acute closer. Surprising, very surprising. So, so Arun Maski, uh, yeah. so I think the lesson is that, that is the guideline is not the rule. Yeah. Guideline is the guideline we should follow, but we take the apply application of the guideline should be individualized as we have taken uh, the decision regarding the management of this patient. So one I question is, it's normally it's if post MI, if four hours, you do angioplasty or you see occluded artery and after half an hour of angiogram, after doing PCI, the ECG changes are not seen. Is there any explanation for this? Uh, actually, uh, I don't know exactly the explanation, but it takes time to get normalized. I have seen this type of ECG after uh, uh, PCI of STEMI. But uh, after a few months, I uh, say six months and to 12 months, the ECG becomes completely normal. Even ECHO says no evidence of uh, enteral MI. So uh, it's difficult to uh, explain why, how this no. happens. And actually, I've Arun seen Maske, many, many patients like that. Arun Maski, actually yes, sir. in this ECG, the ST segment is nearly normalized. Normal, yes, nearly Arta. normalized. But the R wave changes from V1 to V4. That is, there is some loss of the myocardium, definitely shows. Yes. That is the R wave, the, the progression of the R wave from V1 to V4 is not the uh, usual. That is, the, there is some loss of the R wave. So it indicates there is some loss of the myocardium in the precardium. So, but I otherwise, uh, if you take ECG after six months, it may get normalized. Uh, okay, yeah. but it may get normalized, but I think the, this ECG is not totally, absolutely normal. There is also no, some. No. But there is that. definitely there is loss of R wave from V2 yes. to V. But it shows that I there think. is some improvement. There is some changes. That is, you have, you have uh, done that. Uh, uh, that is the correct reperfusion. Yeah, yeah. You did the correct reperfusion. Next, next uh, year. Yeah. The next day, the, this is uh, ECG changes now. Wow. Now you can see ECG now, changes after 16 hours. This is wearing syndrome like ECG. Yeah. So this is uh, valence syndrome like ECG. So how, and, uh, how was the TB flu after angiography? TB3 flu. After priming, how was, what, is, what was it? It was TB3 flu. flu, yeah. And this patient was uh, discharged on 550, uh, but and it uh, he was, we did a COVID test and it came out to be positive, otherwise asymptomatic. <laughs> I don't know whether this patient was COVID positive from the beginning or <laughs> he acquired yeah. COVID positive in hospital. So very difficult to say. <laughs> very difficult to say, but I did uh, in last six, uh, five months, two to three such cases presented with acute MI, did the uh, angioplasty. Uh, at that time, it, was, it used to take uh, three to four days to get the COVID result. So uh, it came, uh, three of the my patients came positive after they have left the hospital and went home and got the result of the COVID. Now in our hospital, we have uh, within 12 hours to get the result. Yeah, but this patient came in emergency, so there's no yeah, scope yeah. of doing COVID. So okay. I'm not, I do not know, maybe this was a hospital acquired or he had uh, COVID. So difficult to say. And, and many and, many of the COVID patients, uh, they first present with acute MI. Uh, Arun, question. Uh, how do you explain these changes, this is changes later on? So, is there any one motion abnormality later on? Because I, 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 will, I, I will show you. I, I will show you. It's coming. So this is a ECG after three weeks. 
Mm. Interesting. And did an echo in this patient. And maybe uh, apical area, some hypokinesis. Otherwise, uh, wall motion is normal. This is an echo after three weeks. My take is that uh, after opening up, there is the debris has created some worn down uh, microvascular occlusion. And did you do the tropile later on? Uh, I don't remember. Actually, I think we did it. It's positive, I think. So. Uh, this the microvascular okay. changes. So, Wadud, yes. Hafiz. Oh, so, Hafiz. Can, I, can I make a comment? Yeah, how are you? Okay, so, fine. it's interesting. So, uh, because I, sorry, I apologize. I joined late. But I yeah. am hearing that you had some late presentation no, no. with EKG changes and yeah, LV dysfunction. No, no. Three hours of chest pain, gave uh, aspirin, clopidogrel, morphine. In hospital, he is totally asymptomatic. ECG subtle changes, not much of changes. So, mm -hmm. hemodynamically stable patient. And the LV function is bad? No, LV function in ER was normal. Okay. And some ECG changes. So, after we finish this, we have, I'll show you ECG. I'll show the, uh, the, from the very beginning, just uh, rapidly hurry on. He can, he's a very yeah. rapid yeah. learner. So, Go to the first one. Yeah. This is a 54 years uh, hypertension yeah. diabetes, chest pain three hours, loaded aspirin, and referred as STEMI for private PC. And this is the ECG. Okay. Okay. And then you took to the cat lab. No, no, no. The patient is in <laughs> emergency. No chest pain, nothing. Echo is normal. This is our second ECG. This is third uh -huh. ECG. And we were discussing whether to take to cath lab or not, whether uh, this is a STEMI or not. So echo okay. was uh, normal. So, okay. so what would you do in this scenario? Because the patient is uh, stable, no chest pain, and ECG is not suggestive of a frank ST elevation in my. Agree. <clears throat> so uh, the, uh, this is, has been a confusing thing. As you know that in the uh, ACC, American College of Cardiology in the beginning were saying, you know, uh, give lytics, do this, that, but we did not incorporate the ultrasound into this. And, but now we are following this. Uh, now we are in the middle of second, second COVID search. We are not taking the patient unless we are convinced clinically and EKG and echo, because many of them are, get, we are getting fooled. You take to the cath lab, Either you see wall motion, maybe stunning, different kind of stunning. Sometimes you see the apical ballooning, reverse takasubu. Sometimes you just see global uh, stunning. Sometimes uh, you see normal LV function. But it will be interesting to see in this patient, because it looks like uh, symptomatically and EKG wise, we are not convinced to take to the cath lab. And you have an echo with normal wall motion. So you can sit tight and watch troponin. But one thing I warn you that if the patient has COVID and there is no lung infiltrate or active COVID, in those cases, it is better to sort out the cardiac. Example, we have patients where the patient was coming with troponin positive, some ST depression and some mild LV dysfunction Chest X-ray, okay. There was no hypoxia. So I, we thought that the COVID diagnosis was incidental. And we, we found multivessel disease. We actually sent the patient for cabbage. And the post-cabbage, patient got uh, takasubu and then recovered. So it is very, very puzzling situation. And I will go by your clinical hunch that what you, whatever you want to do. But if there is a wall motion abnormality, particularly regional wall motion with some doubt, probably you have a case to take to the cath lab. In the absence of that, I'll go by the clinical hunch. So what are the explanation of the later changes of the ECG half is by the last two ECGs? Okay. 
So yeah, this is after post PCI. Okay. One and, hour. Yeah. So and you that, did take the cat lab, looks like. Yeah, yeah. I took to the cat lab. This patient has and, occluded uh, mid uh, mid LED. This was no, an angiogram okay. finding. Okay, so you did not see any wall motion. No wall motion. But you had patient developed chest pain. That's why you took him to the cath lab. No, I was uh, uh, some my instinct said this uh, because of typical ischemic chest pain. Uh, so yeah. Maybe evolving AMI. So why not take to the cath lab? That was yeah, okay, my instinct. And is we this had your a final picture. No, this is a first picture. Uh, we okay. took uh, angiogram. Right was normal. And then what was the final? You got good microvascular. Yeah, and geographically it's good. Okay. So this was a final picture after PCI. Okay. If my problem is that uh, or, uh, you go on yes. showing yeah. it. After well. this, after this uh, uh, PCI, this was um, a ECG taken uh, uh, one hour after PCI. And then ECG is same, this one. And the ECG at discharge, can you show it? Yeah, it's easy at discharge. No, no, it's it came next day morning because we did in evening. So next morning around eight thirty or nine, this is a it's easy. Can you do the skin again to see Habib Bhai? Yeah, I can see. Yeah, so uh, the, you you are follow if, if the patient has clinically no symptom, then I would not worry about this because one of the rule is that the uglier the EKG, the less likely ischemic. Because this is post PCI changes, you do you push debris in the distal microvascular bed. Right, exactly. So, yeah. So, and so this, this is, is all after three weeks. Yeah. So now much better. You are seeing the residual kind of biphasic T. Yes. Wall motion is good. Yeah. This is a wall motion. Apex is a little bit hypo. Apex is a little uh, hypokinetic. And uh, I want to ask you, did you give any stent? Of course you yeah. did. It is. Yeah, but some are reclaiming that in the COVID time, just simple penumbra extraction and balloon, and it's so clean that they are not giving a stent, you know? No, no, this patient uh, was asymptomatic. We could not do uh, COVID, but after, before discharge, we did a COVID and it turned out to be COVID. We don't know if it was uh, before or during hospital. So, so this is the thing I told you that this is a bystander COVID. If the COVID is the issue, then it is more problem because this patient had no COVID symptoms, chest x-ray, normal. So this is like our usual uh, pathway of acute coronary syndrome. But when there is a COVID active with fever, cough, and then chest infiltrate hypoxia and EKG changes, it becomes much more complex. So normally this is for students. I mean, normal hyperacute ST elevation, Q waves, then ST T changes and Q waves. This is a normal ST changes. So my take home message is history clinical judgment is, is important in diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome. ECG at early stage may not be diagnostic, there's the importance of serial ECG in ACS. Early uh, coronary angiogram and PCI should be considered if we think this is high likelihood of acute coronary syndrome. Thank you. Thank you, Maki, for your interview. Thank you very much. Very and interesting. Thank you, Rapis, for your excellent explanation about the ECG changes. So, Dr. Maski, what you are going to do with the COVID-19 positive now? <laughs> it's already three weeks. It's asymptomatic. <laughs> so I don't think I would be doing anything because we made so, a protocol of uh, doing uh, COVID in all patients which we do procedure. Otherwise, it was totally asymptomatic. Maybe uh, that may be pre-existing or maybe hospital acquired. 